for coming today. Uh, it is a, um, it's a real pleasure to uh, have my colleague, uh, Toby Dodge, here to speak on Iraq. You know, there were uh, many great things about coming to the ISS when I joined over three years ago. And I do admit that one of them was being a colleague of Toby's. Uh, I've tried to uh, understand Iraq for the better part of uh, two decades. And still working at it. And uh, those of us who are students of Iraq uh, learned so much from Toby, who's really a teacher on Iraq. And I go as far as saying I'm the best scholar of Iraq of, uh, of his generation. Uh, he is a consulting senior fellow for the Middle East at the ISS. He is also at the London School of Economics, where he is a reader in international relations. He's written extensively on Iraq, and his published works are available uh, for uh, you all to see, including Inventing Iraq, The Failure of, failure of Nation Building, and The History Denied, uh, as well as several of Delphi books and articles, including uh, one we have available from the next forthcoming issue of Survival, Iraq's Road Back to Dictatorship, is the title of his talk today is Iraq caught between dictatorship and civil war. So Toby, welcome. All right, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, and, uh, for the invite, and uh, for back to Wasser for making sure I got here from the airport uh, yesterday evening, which was the task in itself. And thank you all for coming. There's someone in the audience who rang me up uh, from Washington about uh, a month ago and said, uh, no one cares about Iraq anymore. Uh, and he was a journalist, he said, so you can tell me whatever you want and no one will blame you. <laughs> and this audience is, is tantamount to, to, to my optimism and his pessimism. I thought we might just be three or four of us in an audience having a chat over coffee, so that's great. Now, as we all know, uh, it's been five months since the US troops left Iraq under the terms of the Status of Forces Agreement. And with that in mind, what I want to do today is, is uh, three things, I think. First, as you'll see from that article and some of my recent work, I want to state what seems to me to be the blindingly obvious, but in coffee beforehand, someone said, no, 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 state, state the blindingly obvious, people don't follow Iraq in, in Washington anymore, um, and so they may have missed this. And for me, at least, the blindingly obvious is that Nouri al-Maliki, Prime Minister since 2006, is undoubtedly, rapaciously, strategically moving towards a dictatorship. That, for me, is the obvious. But secondly, I want to try and tease out the ramifications of this. This doesn't seem to have uh, created much of a stir, not even in this room, but certainly uh, outside Baghdad and outside the events of the middle of December when he moved against his own vice president. And I think the ramifications of this uh, are numerous. Firstly, I think there, there may well be an increase in violence. Certainly, uh, the, the US, before they went, did a very good job of building a, 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 very, a fairly competent um, army that can control the country in a rough and ready way, but also what, what wasn't done was to either deliver the institutional capacity, the civilian institutional capacity to knit the state together, and also, as we've seen from Mr. Al-Maliki's own uh, variant, variance between sectarianism, a kind of sh a militant Shia nationalism, or indeed an Iraq nationalism, I don't think there is the ideology to tie the country together. So if you're talking about a move towards a dictatorship, the lack of institutional capacity to try to stay together and the lack of binding ideology we've been looking at. Well, someone, a friend of mine, Rad al Qadiri, over coffee this morning, suggested it may well be Nigeria on steroids. Now, while you're wrestling with that um, beautifully honed but somewhat uh, inaccurate uh, comparison, finally, and I do this very tentatively and probably if I have a, a, a few minutes at the end, very gently as an Englishman in DC, what I want to do is be a little bit bold and say why I think this poses a problem for the United States government. I think Obama uh, was a very, ran a very bold platform of getting out of Iraq, and that's what he's doing. But I think as he leaves, uh, I think as he backs out the door, as he's done, I think a, a more coherent and I think more muscular policy towards avoiding that end, or at least mediating in any way that the United States can do that end, actually encouraging the sustainability of democratic institutions and indeed the autonomy both of Iraq's civil service but more importantly Iraq's other political leaders in that ruling elite who are uh, feeling increasingly vulnerable. Now let's look at the rise and rise of Nouri al-Maliki. As we know, uh, Nouri al-Maliki came to the office of the Prime Minister in 2006 
156 days after the second set of elections in December 2005. And he got the job quite simply because of what he wasn't. And what he wasn't was Ibrahim al Jafari, his boss. Jafari, as we know, had somewhat of a mixed reputation as an prime, interim prime minister, uh, had some responsibility at least of driving the country into civil war where it was um, in 2006. And uh, al Maliki was picked, one, because he wasn't al Jafari, but two, he wasn't seen to pose a threat to any of the competing members of the ruling elite, the party bosses who were dividing the spoils of government up between them in terms of ministerial appointments and the finances they brought after that election. <coughs> now, through 2005, 6, into 2007, anyone who was in Baghdad would be immediately presented with a series of plausible and implausible plots to remove Maliki. Maliki was just about to go all the way through, possibly, till 2008 and the charge of the night. The, the elite was milling around him, but couldn't combine, as they, they can't combine today, to get that elusive majority in the House of Representatives and to pass a vote of no conflict. So Maliki stumbled on, as it were, from his appointment in, um, in 2006 through until the second set of national elections in uh, March 2010. Now, what Maliki did during that period of time was, I think, quite amazing. Against the background of, if not a collapsed state, an extremely weak state, the civil war through to at least 2008, and a very fractured elite, he slowly reached out using what Joel Ravens called the Malakayun, this group of people tied to the person and spread his tentacles through nearly every aspect of the state. The party first, the Dawa Islamic Party, the military, the intelligence services, and now in this final stage, the civil institutions of the state and indeed that political elite that have never got round to getting rid of them. So he started this consolidation by ousting al Jafri as head of the Islamic Dawa party and appointing himself as general secretary. Now this meant it gave him a stable, if you want, basis of recruitment of like-minded Shia Islamists to act as his vehicle to controlling the wider reaches of the state. From 2007, al-Maliki focused most of its attention on the military wing of the state so carefully uh, built by the United States, so heavily invested in. And he did this by undermining, <coughs> undermining the, the, the rigidly built chain of command from the Ministry of Defense through to the commanders on the ground. And the first big move he did was setting up the office of the Commander-in-Chief. Now, this has been originally envisioned by US military advisors as a coordinating forum for the Prime Minister to chair. It rapidly became much more powerful, much more institutionalized, and much larger in terms of the staff that it controlled. He moved, Maliki moved it into the office of the Prime Minister and appointed a close ally to run it and staff it with trusted functionaries. The office of the Commander, of the, uh, the, the office of the Commander in Chief then issued orders directly to battalion heads, sometimes using their personal mobile phones to move troops around. The office became uh, increasingly and directly appointed in a promotion of senior staff, favoring people the Prime Minister thought could be manipulated, thought were loyal to him, peripherizing or indeed forcing out of the armed forces those he didn't trust. Now again in 2007, this move took a leap forward when the Baghdad Operations Center was set up at the start of the surge. Now again, what seemed to be an organizationally good idea, the, uh, the, 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 the centering of the command and control of both the police and the army, all forces in one province, in one organization that was recognized by the Prime Minister as a way of getting dominance over the armed forces. As these operation centers spread across most of the troublesome, the most strategically vulnerable and violent provinces of Iraq, uh, one general was uh, appointed to run each of them, and that general, unsurprisingly, was run from an office in Baghdad, was appointed and controlled from an office in Baghdad that Maliki controlled, again undermining the chain of command, again tying the military, coup proofing it, fracturing it, and tying it directly to the Prime Minister's whims. I think you could argue this reached its peak, this process in the military, when the Iraqi Special Operations Forces, the US trained, uh, considered to be some of the best trained in the region, now consisting of 4,200 soldiers, 
In eight, again in 2007, in April 2007, once they'd been created and trained, the US handed them back to the, uh, the, Iraqi, to the Iraqi government. They should have gone to the Ministry of Defense, and instead, uh, Maliki took them, set up a separate institution to control them, removed them from prime ministerial oversight, and brought them in to his own control, a Praetorian guard. They are now referred to by Iraq, as rather ironically, with somewhat of dark humor, as the Fedayeen al-Maliki, in reference to the Iraqi Special Operations Forces being a striking force for the Prime Minister. Their sartorial elements dressed in, in, in black, but also an ironic reference to Saddam Hussein's Fedayeen al-Saddam, who were, again, a very unpopular striking force of the previous regime. This process rolled on and rolled through to the intelligence services where General Mohammed al shawani who was appointed and then used by the center, who was appointed to for the head of the uh, National Iraqi Intelligence Services, helped uh, by the CIA to set up a national intelligence service. In the end, was forced out in August 2009 in Iran, in an Arau over who was responsible for a series of, of bombings in Baghdad in that time. <coughs> There are now six separate outfits spread across different ministries in Baghdad competing with each other, and through that fractured intelligence and politicized, fractured and politicized intelligence gathering, Maliki has stepped, and there's evidence if you read WikiLeaks closely that the State Department has been worried about the fact that the Prime Minister was using his office to purge, to purge mid-ranking intelligence officers from the intelligence services, again, that he didn't trust or couldn't manipulate, therefore politicizing, personalizing, along with the armed forces, and tying the intelligence services to himself. Now, if we want to see um, the public face of Nouriel Maliki's, who we say, uh, troubled relationship with democracy, we see it in the outcome of the last set of national elections. He was I think it's fair to say in the run-up to those elections, almost certain he would receive a sweeping uh, uh, majority and was, was staggered when um, uh, um, Ayad al-Awi's Iraqiya coalition got 91 seats and his own state of law coalition only got 89 seats. His response to not winning was instructive. He issued a statement saying, no way will we accept these results and said, demanding a recount to prevent what he said would be a return to violence. Now, that might just be the kind of um, the bad grapes, the sour grapes of someone who didn't win. When we realized that, that statement was issued deliberately and specifically in his role as commander in chief, it takes on a rather sinister, um, sinister slant. Now, again, if there were 156 days of negotiations after the election results of December 2005, in 2010, there were 249 days of negotiations. And I think we can understand two reasons why the formation of this next government took so much time. Firstly, and obviously, was the fear that I've just documented. The fear amongst the ruling elite that Nouri al-Maliki had centered military and intelligence power in his own hands and was clearly moving towards an authoritarian form of government. But of course, on the other side of that was a different fear. The, uh, the election settlement that had been reached, the political deal that had been done after from 2003 to 2005, but especially after 2005, promoted a set of politicians and political parties who'd reached prominence in exile. The Kurdistan, the Kurdistan Democratic Party, the Patriotic Union, Union of Kurdistan, Nouri al-Maliki's own party, um, Dawa, and a various uh, array of other parties that were promoting the voting on terms of ethno-nationalism, sectarian identity. The victory of Iraqi, or at least Iraqi is uh, winning a plurality of the votes, looks like a direct threat to that. Partly if you wanted to use sectarian labeling, which is a rough and ready and probably inaccurate. In this case, people voted for Iraqi to maximize a certain a sense of dispossession, a certain, sect, a certain uh, alienation towards sectarianism, and a great feeling of persecution amongst the Sunni population of Baghdad in the Northwest that the full power of the state during the Civil War and especially its aftermath had been unleashed against them. So an, an Alawi premiership would not only be a threat 
Tanui al-Maliki personally, but also the Islamicist Shia parties, but also the Kurdish regional government that had scrapped and argued with um, Najafi, who's now who's a, uh, a key, uh, son of Najafi, who's a key member of Iraq here, but also his brother up in Mosul. So in the way those two opposing fears balanced out, and the result was the Erbil agreement negotiated by Barzani in Erbil in November 2010. This 15-point agreement put a serious constraints on Nur al-Maliki, but allowed him to retain the premiership. Um, and then divided up yet again the Iraqi government um, in a government of national unity with politicians being given key ministries. I think it's fair to say, if that was November 2010, by today, June 2012, we can say unambiguously that the Abil Agreement was a triumph for Nur al-Maliki. He was meant to give the Minister's Defence and Interior to people not aligned to himself, and that a National Council for Strategic Policy was meant to be set up, which would put a break on him, which would act almost as a clearinghouse for all major policy. None of that has happened. You could argue that Nuri al-Maliki is more powerful today than he has ever been, less restrained by the rest of the governing elite, and indeed less restrained by an election result that he basically lost, or at least come, came second in. So I think that is the problem that we face in Iraq today. A prime minister centralizing power, and now he's using it, I think, with um, increasing uh, subtlety, increasing, it's gone way beyond the control of the military. In January 2011, Chief Justice Medhat al Mahmoud ruled that a set of previously independent institutions set up by Paul Bremer during the occupation of Iraq, the Committee of Integrity, the Independent High Electoral Commission, the Central Bank of Iraq, and the High Commission for Human Rights were now to be moved and placed under the authority of the cabinet not the parliament. The cabinet, as we know, is a fractured, diverse, it doesn't sit together as a decision-making body. If you move responsibility into that, you're giving responsibility to the dominant actor within the cabinet, the office of the prime minister. If we then turn to parliament, the great oversight body in the constitution that's meant to be, um, meant to be guarding Iraq's democracy from just this type of attack, I spoke recently um, to a very senior uh, parliamentarian who wanted, for obvious reasons, to, to the interview to be conducted under terms of anonymity. And I asked him, look, what's Parliament doing? Why can't the, the, the Prime Minister has clearly abrogated every aspect of the Abel Agreement? Why can't we move against him? And this is a direct quote. The, the, the man sat back in his chair and put his palms to the ceiling in a gesture of helplessness and said, quote, if we more move towards a vote of no confidence, do you think he, Al Maliki, would allow members to reach the chamber? And if they did, do you really think he would take any notice of such a measure? This is a senior parliamentarian doubting profoundly the ability of his parliament to actually deliver the only thing left a vote of no confidence in the prime minister. So where does that leave us in the last five or 10 minutes? of this thing. What is the future of Iraq? Well, I think a lot of emphasis has intriguingly been put in the communities of the Northwest in a push towards federalism, pointing to the Constitution, saying the Constitution, hastily, controversially written in 2005, is our last chance to escape the creeping authoritarianism from Baghdad. And we can do that by voting a, provincial, uh, a vote in the Provincial Council, moving towards uh, a referendum in our province. This, is, this has been proposed um, in Diyala, in, and proposed again in Anbar and Salahuddin. What's happened? New waves of repression in those provinces, and the votes have never taken place. Not as much repression in Basra and Awasa province down in the south in 2010 and 2011 when this happened, but the Prime Minister acts have been blocking referendums to push this forward. I think we have a clear indication that the constitution where the parliamentary constraints, the federalist constraints, is not acting as a, a break or indeed a guiding principle on Iraqi politics and on the move towards um, the consolidation of power in the office of the prime minister. What are the results of this? Well, I think 
from April 2012 onwards, we've seen a, a, a set of very clear demands from key Iraqi politicians in Washington and in Baghdad, damning um, Nouri al-Maliki as a potential dictator. Ayd Alawi, the former prime minister and leader of Iraq here, wrote that the country is slipping back into the clutches of a dangerous new one-man rule, which will inevitably lead to full dictatorship. Masoud <coughs> Barzani, as you know, I'm sure, in this town, very powerfully, very uh, repeatedly, and since he's left and gone home, he said Iraq is facing a series of crises it's coming towards a one-round rule. On the 28th of April in Erbil, Masoud Barzani, Ayad Alawi, Osama Najafi, and uh, Muqtada al sada issued a 15, set of, uh, of uh, nine points demanding that the Prime Minister be constrained and setting a 15-day deadline. That's the 14th of April by my calculations which they said they would think about, think about moving towards a vote of no confidence if he did not meet these demands. I would, I would eat a hat that I don't possess if that vote of no confidence ever comes to fruition. Basically, as Sada la landed in Erbil on the tarmac before he went to that uh, meeting, he said, my role isn't to remove the Prime Minister. Masoud Barzani reportedly turned to uh, Sada and said it's the role of the Shia party, the INA, to pull the trigger, to push for a vote of no confidence. Sada said, I won't do it. So when we come, I think, to the 14th of April, you can say this is a damn squib, but I think this removes any doubt about the process that I've been describing. Any doubt that Maliki is moving towards a dictatorship, consolidating power, but it also raises profound questions about the rest of the Iraqi elite. What do they do? If they can't move, if they haven't got the numbers to move towards a vote of no confidence, if Maliki is continually abrogating the constitution and posing a direct threat not only to democracy, but their welfare, what do they do? I suspect they can't do a lot. There is clearly a risk of increased violence. But I think one of the legacies that the United States occupation left Iraq is a strong or a strong enough military forces to impose a rough and ready order on the country. I think if you look at the terms of the size of the military, in January this year it had 933,000 people on its payroll spread between the Minister of Defence, Minister of the Interior, and the Prime Minister's counterterrorism force. It shows you what type of violence they're organised to defeat. The staff and the Minister of the Interior are double those. In the military. Basically, this is a, a robust, large force designed to keep the domestic peace. In 2010, the total number of people employed by the security forces equaled 12% of Iraq, oh, 8% of Iraq's workforce, or 12% of the total population of that man. Iraq Ministry of Defense and Ministry of the Interior budgets have been increasing by 25 to 45 percent each year. Basically, I think what we have is a country with a military large enough and robust enough to keep that rough and ready uh, order. We have a political process that is uh, that is collapsed, that cannot regulate and constrain the Prime Minister, and indeed we're heading towards new elections. Now, I know a lot of people in this town and indeed in this government say it's the next set of elections. There's where we have to fight to, con to keep the independence of IHEC, the High Election Committee, that they did indeed oversee and guarantee the independence of the last election. The head of the, the, the Independent Higher Education, uh, High Election Committee was arrested last month on a petty, petty charge of corruption involving no more than a few hundred dollars, held in jail overnight. I know for three days, three or four days. What's going on there? I think it's fair. <coughs> I have reports that the Prime Minister rang him up in his prison cell and said, it's all right, son, I'll, well, that's a rough translation, it's all right, sir, I'll get you out. We'll make sure this doesn't happen again. That's a clear move by the Prime Minister to put his arms around the head of the election committee and say, you know where the power in this country lies. Let's make sure that that election doesn't go the wrong way again. So what does this mean? I think we have a state with little or no, very low civilian institutional capacity. The Iraqi government says that it can deliver 
of Iraq's electricity uh, needs. I think you'll find on reliable surveys that households get on average seven hours a day. That may not seem dreadful, but as we head into an Iraqi summer, where even the basic needs of a household are dependent on air conditioning, that is pretty bad. 7.2 million people in Iraq haven't got access to clean drinking water. The economy is in tatters. A population regularly prone to expressing their quite right outrage at the lack of electricity on the street heading into another long hot sun. Ideologically, what ties Iraq together? Now, I, I, like a lot of people, have wrote, written in detail and at great length about Iraqi nationalism, but I doubt that's enough. I think in the aftermath of the Civil War, we had different competing Iraqi nationalisms around different symbols of the Shia and the Sunni faith, and I think it's very difficult to see the mobilization of the unity around Baghdad, especially around the Baghdad with Nur al-Malik as a prime minister who's prone and is pretty vulnerable to outbursts of what we would uh, politely describe as somewhat sectarian language. And so we have little ideological unity. We have great potential oil wealth, but I don't think the state has the coherent enough institutions to deliver that in a fashion that would demobilize the population, so not winter is a much more like kleptocracy, given that Iraq, I think, is rated the eighth most corrupt country in the world by Transparency International with estimates of 10% of its GDP going to corruption, but quite a lot of capacity to keep its population demobilized and not posing a threat to the government. Now, in the last two minutes of my chair's tolerance, I'll say why this poses a problem for the United States government. I think it would be fair to gently suggest that the United States, I think it's, it's a fact that the United States government got its shoulder very firmly and diplomatically behind the Bill Agreement and pushed it forward, but I don't think it has been there as strongly and as coherently to make sure the tenets of the Bill Agreement have been upheld and, uh, and applied. Now, I'm not in any way saying that the United States shouldn't withdraw. I think they should have. I, I, I don't see that they can have much more, but I am saying the United States have a much more active and muscular <coughs> democracy support program in the country, that it should be moving away from what looks like, to me at least, that will be an outsider to Washington, a, uh, a policy of, if at very best, softly, softly behind the door criticism of that. When Barzani came to Washington, uh, reports suggest, uh, and, and indeed gave a closed door briefing in the three rooms, reports suggested he didn't get the guarantees or indeed the support that he was looking for from the current administration. I think sustained and powerful critique of what's going on by the Prime Minister, Nuri al Maliki, but also the security services where, uh, where torture is endemic. But also, as with the color revolutions across Eastern Europe, I think sustained financial support for parliamentary democracy and for those parties committed and engaged in that. That involves going to a party like Iraq here and saying, this is how you organize your party. Here is expertise, training, and funding to do so. That will level the playing field. That will at least give the brave Democrats fighting against the centralization of power, the use of torture, the use of corruption, some, uh, some <coughs> support and hope to get their message out. But I suspect it won't, in the end, constrain Nuri al Maliki's move towards democracy. Let's move towards dictatorship. Thank you very much. Toby, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And um, I'm going to make sure I see you and I'll uh, get a list going uh, for questions. I'm going, to, I'm going to take the first one. Uh, so you talked about the, um, you felt it was difficult and unlikely for a vote of no confidence to take place in the parliament. And even if it did, that person said whether Maliki would allow it. place a very um, effective network <coughs> among the security apparatus in the body. So, um, play this out a little bit. I think I see the uh, scenario for continued dictatorship, which you might know, you also talk, tell us a little more about the civil war aspect. I mean, what are the, 
what, what are the events you see happening that, that could lead to that? And, and how likely uh, is that? Well, I think as analysts, we're, um, we're all prone to the trauma of our previous experiences and sitting in Baghdad in 2007, 2008, as the civil war unfolded, uh, it, it's, it's one of those that I've witnessed and not least that, of course, the Iraqi population has suffered from. I think when, you're, when, when I was writing this talk and writing the paper that you can, that you can take away with you, I'm looking at, so, the institutions of democracy, the institutions of representation, and I think, let's face it, that excellent electoral outcome, um, where the populations of the Northwest who've been alienated for, and, and uh, the Northwest Iraq and Baghdad, largely Sunni populations have been alienated from the political process, were persuaded to put their faith in the ballot box. And you see this two million, I've got a figure somewhere, two million nine hundred thousand people turn out and vote for Iraq. Yeah, they invest their hope, I think, in a mass mobilization in what the ballot box can bring. And what's it called? Their vice president driven out of the country on what on charges like that were at least extracted by torture, not completely um, The Evil Agreement uh, swept to one side, no no independent or non uh, uh, individuals running the security service, security, service, security forces, the Minister of Interior, Minister of Defense, those forces being used, especially brutally in the Salahuddin, to, to, to mobilize, suppose, to, to round up supposed ex barbers and grand prison with all that entails for, Iraq, for what happens to Iraq as a prison. Where do those people go? And indeed, after, when is it the, after the 14th of April, when these nine points lapse, as it were, uh, it's 14th of May, where do these people go? Of course they will become alienated. I think, of course, that they, they, they will, their faith in the, diplomatic, in the democratic process will be tried. And the danger is that you have the remobilization of violence against a, a system that excluded and uh, uh, persecuted them. That's <coughs> what's on the table. Now, do I think, I certainly think a, a, a rise in politically motivated violence by people alienated from the political system is, is, a, is, a, is a problem. But the extent to which that violence can take off and run, I think, ironically, the very strength that our maliki has built up in the security service and the size of the security services will put limits on that. So, I mean, caught between dictation and civil war, civil war is an option, but I suspect given the surge, given the way that the purveyors of violence were very effectively targeted and taken down, and given the fact that Iraqi security forces is at, at a peak as well, much larger than it ever has been, I think the space for civil war has been radically reduced. Or resulting for questions. Yes, uh, in the back, I think I saw Stanley Cobra's hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm looking at an editorial that appeared in the Kurdish Globe um, a couple of days ago. It's on Kurdish independence. Let me read a couple of sentences. The integrity of Iraq is no longer sustainable. Formation of a democratic, plural, and federal Iraq was and is a waste of time. The Kurds cannot sit and wait for others to permit independence. It must be fought for. So my question to you. How seriously do you take this danger of a Kurdish war for independence? I, I should no. And um, how seriously do you take the danger of a Kurdish war for independence? And what do you think the reaction of Turkey and Iran would be? But let me step back from the war and then move towards the war and look at the demands for independence. Now, as you know, the uh, Senior players in the Kurdish regional government, Talibani and Barzani, worked very hard to shape a constitution in 2005 that deliberately weakened Baghdad so that it could never happen again. That the armies, the Iraqi armies of Baghdad, flying up through over the Green Line and suppressing them. Now, you could argue they failed in that, and clearly the movement of troops and artillery into Kirkuk recently indicates their worst fears. You could argue that, certainly. That said, the Kurdish regional government, I think, gets a billion dollars a year from the national budget under the 17% uh, deal, I think, which over represents the size of the Kurdish population. Uh, Kurdish, uh, Kurdish, uh, Kurdish regional government's own oil, oil uh, deposits can no way match that for a long time. They can never match that if they can't get the oil out to the international market beyond uh, the informal trucking that goes on at the moment. My own understanding would be that the Kurdish government, will, or the Turkish government, will not allow that. They'll flirt with them, 
they'll encourage them, but they'll in no way make their own economic development dependent on an independent Kurdish uh, regional government or independent Kurdish state. So I think we've got a I think we've got a situation where the Kurds want to be half pregnant in a way. They want to demand the right to secede, and I think they should have the right to secede. If there's a referendum they want to go, they should go. But I think they go into an extremely difficult economic situation with hostile neighbors that don't want them to secede. But I think that's the problem. And the solution, I, you know, I feel very much for Masoud Barzani. I think that there doesn't seem to be an obvious solution at the moment. The, the Kurdish region government's economy is directly dependent on the money it gets from Baghdad. And I think Nuri al-Maliki and Hussein al Shastani are very clearly aware of that. So that constrains them and puts them in a box. And for a greater violence, not in the medium term, I wouldn't have thought. In the long term, it depends on the ambitions of Baghdad, I suspect, not the vulnerabilities of uh, the uh, Judith Kipper. Uh, thank you very much, Toby. Good to have you here. Um, I would argue that uh, for the United States, we're done with Iraq, regardless of who gets elected. Uh, I can't see either side uh, re-engaging with Iraq to prevent the scenario that you have uh, so magnificently described. I'd like to ask you, uh, in your study of this situation, uh, if the situation in Syria, as it deteriorates, impacts on Iraq and in which way? And let's say Bashar went and there was a nice general there and things calmed down, the violence ended, the international community rallied around Syria and so on. Would an improved situation in Syria have an impact uh, on Iraq as the negative one may? Thanks for that, Judith. Just, the United States is done with Ukraine. No one's, I am no way suggesting that the United States re-engage in a more muscular way. What I am suggesting is that they have a policy and a muscular policy that's direct to the outcome that they want. And I'm, what I'm suggesting here tentatively then, the outcome, the current outcome isn't what they want. So I know there are people in this town, you know, some of them are very good friends of mine, which lament the, the, the state of the forces agreement, lament that it couldn't have been extended, lament that the, the Obama administration wasn't more muscular in doing that. I'm not one of those people. What I am saying is, what I am gently suggesting is, the United States need a, need a much more across the board muscular policy in promoting democracy. Now, Syria, you're interesting. Uh, you're promoting or you're suggesting a scenario where the regime in Damascus solidifies its capacity holds onto its territory and, and regains control. <clears throat> Back to the future, as it were, in Syria as well as Iraq. I, I suggest, I mean, if that happened, then what are we looking at? We're looking at the solidification of that border, the sealing of that border to some extent, and the status quo ante with probably a, a weaker Syrian government. I suggest that's probably not the most likely outcome, but I think the immediate fall of the Syrian government also is the most likely. I think what we're working on is a the increasing instability in Syria with the regime holding on to power by concentrating its resources and its control in its own heartlands and its community and the, the large majority of the population of Syria uh, not deciding which side of the fence they're sitting on because overtly deciding that will have huge costs if they get it wrong. Now for Iraq that means two things. I think it means the long Syrian um, uh, Iraqi border is, is, highly, uh, is highly fluid. But you've had that reverse engineering where jihadi tourists, weapons and, and combat uh, people fighting used to come across the border in Syria into Iraq. It's clear evidence the reverse is happening now. Again, ironically, that's not at the moment a great problem uh, for Nuri al-Maliki. Indeed, he's exporting his battle heart and there wells But the difficulty is if that reverses, or that if you have uh, the worst case scenario is a uh, an area of, of, of non-government control on both sides of the border, a kind of conflict zone. Again, I, that's a medium term. Both of those are worst case scenarios. At the moment, I suspect that the, the, both the Iraqi and the Syrian governments have enough control over their populations to stop the Iraqi situation spinning out of control. That may change if the, if the United States government decides a more muscular path to intervention. It may change if the Saudi and the Gatteries uh, arm, the, arm the, the rebels more than they're, in a, in a greater fashion than they already are. But at the moment, if you're working on the status quo ante, which is a weak Syrian government under siege but managing to stay in power, 
that isn't the worst case for Iraq at all. The worst case will be if that regime falls, it's replaced by civil war or a Muslim Brotherhood organization, a Muslim Brotherhood led regime, and then Iran that finds its political and strategic depth in Syria will turn to Iraq. And, and I think quite a lot of relative autonomy that this ruling regime has managed to, Nir al Maliki has managed to build up, then disappears. So I think that's a, a, the worst case scenario where Iraq, in a way, becomes a cockpit for regional fighting after the Syrian, for regional competition between, say, the, the, the Turkish Saudi axis and the Iranian axis. That, that is what truly worries the ruling elite in Baghdad at the moment. Uh, there's a question here. Yes. If you could state your name and affiliation. Hello. Um, my name is Luke. I'm from Old Dominion University. Um, uh, the Old Dominion University Mali United Nations uh, Society. Um, I had a question. If um, the, this prime minister, he does become the authoritarian, you know, he, he wins, I guess, in fact. Do you think that the diversity of the group, along with the Arab Spring that has been happening, that even if he does become an authoritarian, he can't really diminish too many of, like, I guess you would say, personal freedoms? I mean, is that model gone as an authoritarian? Or does it still exist because they're just so tired of fighting? They'd rather just live than be free. Thank you. I think there, there are three big issues there, and I think the Arab Spring, quite where, what type of authoritarianism this, this could evolve into. And a third one, which I'll add, which I'll take, is the diversity of the ruling elite that was brought back into the country, recreated in Iraq after 2003. I think those three are really interesting issues. As we know, the Spring came to Baghdad, the Arab Spring came to Baghdad, but was quite quickly suppressed, as it were, or managed and demobilized. It proved to be a bigger and problem in Erbil and a more violent suppression, I think, across the Kurdish regional government. But, but both of those have been successfully overcome. I think Maliki and his ideological approach to Iraq varies. You know, there are two Nur al Malikis, depending on how confident he's been. There's a Nur al Maliki of the post uh, charge of the Knights of the first set of um, uh, the, the, the first set of elections after the charge of the Knights, the provincial elections, where he ran, I think, a very overtly nationalist campaign, arguing against the, uh, the, the ISKI, the Islamic Supreme Council of Iraq, arguing against the Kurds, arguing for centralization, and claiming that he was the, the strong Iraqi nationalist leader that brought law and order to the country. There's Nur al Maliki of the uh, March 2010 elections, who was running on a debathification, the spectre of the Ba'ath Party coming back to take away our hard-won freedoms, and, and, and that using that as the drapery behind which a, a fairly unsubtle sectarian campaign was launched to solidify his core cool vote, and ironically to increase the Iraqi vote against him. And I think that those two Nuri al-Malikis are in, when Maliki feels threatened, it becomes the sectarian, the threat of the, the Ba'athists, um, as he unleashed in Saladin late last year, when he's feeling confident, he feels he can appeal to the whole of Iraq. I think on the personal freedoms, to ask you, answer your question directly, we've already seen campaigns by Islamist militias against uh, the, the, was it the Urmos, people who stand up, people allegedly who are gay, the killing of those in, in Baghdad, the suppression of women, especially in Basra, but across Iraq, who are asserting their freedom to dress as they choose and to, to, to exist in the public sphere. Depending on the, the, the ideological path Maliki chooses to take, we could see him backing such campaigns. Um, I, but I suspect what he'll concentrate on if he's feeling particularly vulnerable is the kind of sectarian uh, spectre dressed up in the, the sectarian camp messaging dressed up in respect to the class. Uh, yes, I mean, I heard you saying that uh, uh, Maliki is trying to concentrate power on Islam. And my question is that what kind of relationship he has with the religious establishment in Iraq and the Marja'iyya, and uh, especially Sistani, but we heard like he tried to had a meeting with Sistani and Sistani refused and then this and that and exploited everywhere and the, the, the holy cities and Najaf Karbala and so on. Yeah, I think that the, the Majahi and especially Sistani are 
deliberately and I think deservedly ambiguous <coughs> that, the, that after the, <coughs> the head-on collision between Sistani and Bremer, uh, to a certain extent, Sistani has, has moved into a, a larger or more obscure, uh, obscure role of kind of, of guardian of what his role is, guardian of, of, of religious morality, and he's loath to directly uh, engage in politics. So is refusing to meet Maliki uh, a critique of Maliki, or not wanting to be tied to Maliki's campaign, or not wanting to him to be seen as Maliki's man, or is it just an ambiguity, I don't want to deal with politics, unless I very, very much have to. I suspect it's a mixture too. I think Sistani uh, is an astute, a very astute observer of Iraqi politics. I think he's had some moments when certain Shia politicians, certain politicians who are Shia, have deliberately sought to misrepresent him or claim that he was backing things that he hadn't given his express or, in fact, implicit backing to. And I think he's determined that won't happen again. And that determination is, is, is backed <coughs> by a refusal to directly engage. I won't meet uh, Maliki, certainly. I won't give him that benefit, but I won't directly criticize. And I suspect, unless something goes very badly wrong, that's where it will go. That's where it will continue to go. And that ambiguity, that not direct um, intervention in politics, which again will allow certain politicians, you, I'm sure you've heard, I have, uh, oh, Matt, uh, Sassani said to me, I should do this, this, and this. Sassani, well, I'm, I'm, sir, I'm not saying that you're misrepresenting what the great man said, but I'd be very surprised if you put it in those stark terms. I think uh, Sassani has been clear in not wanting to directly be involved in what's very hard not to be interpreted as being. Thank you, Robert. Uh, so, Toby, thanks for uh, uh, a, a very enlightening uh, analysis. Uh, your, your criticism um, is more personal and less institutional, uh, my reading of it. And, and uh, it was actually heartened in the end of your presentation, where you actually start talking about the institutions, and thing of the institutions of Iraqi State. Um, and my question is, how much do you think the, the, the power consolidation of the prime minister is also in direct linkage to our own initiative to have an all-inclusive but ineffectual government? Uh, frankly, if you speak to our offices in Baghdad, and if you speak to Baghdadis, um, you know, um, there's a lot of respect and support for the prime minister, specifically because law and order and the, the, the acts of terrorism have actually been reduced for the past couple of years since he's been the helm. So, um, yeah, um, it's a great question, as I'd expect. I think um, the Iraqi system, the political settlement set up after 2005, as, as you indicated, these governments of national unity where the ministries are divided amongst the victorious parties, have directly contributed amongst a series of other factors to, to institutional state weakness, where ministers come in and treat those ministries in a, in a, either as a personal fiefdom to, uh, to, to fund their buying of houses in London, or as a political fiefdom to fund party political patronage and the packing out of um, of ministerial payrolls. Now, that has directly undermined the institutional capacity of the state and has increased uh, and driven corruption forward. So you can see, certainly, uh, and this would be, I suspect, the comparison between what you could term inst uh, kind of efficient corruption and inefficient corruption. You could see the, the population of Baghdad and Iraq saying, for God's sake, we're not stupid. We see what's going on. We see ministers with nothing one day, with great wealth the next. And we see one single man who has, as far as I know, unless you know different, no uh, obvious trappings of personal wealth, consolidating power and making the state more efficient. Thank God. I'll add some caveats to that. Nouri al Maliki himself has been directly responsible for undermining anti corruption campaigns, has, uh, has, has made uh, the, the, the investigation of corruption and the people doing it's like very, very difficult. So, and, I wouldn't, and again, I'm not suggesting he's personally corrupt, but I'm suggesting corruption plays a role in his ruling strategy of tying people to himself and rewarding them. That's, that's the truth. And I think 
if you look at the institutions of the state which were stronger than most, military, interior, and intelligence, his control over them had directly undermined their coherence. So centralizing power in his own hands has undermined the institutions he centralized the coherence of them. So I think this move towards an authoritarianism could, you could argue, in the end, lead to a much more coherent state, that it would cut out, slice off the corrupt and coherent members of uh, the, the much more unwieldy ruling elite, send them into exile and send their bank accounts and their practices into exile, central, uh, centralize uh, power in one man or one organization, one party, prime minister's office hands, and make the Iraqi state more coherent. Yes, possibly. But that's a long way down the line. And a lot of bloodshed and tears that will have to be shed as we get to that. And also, Mubarak uh, in, in uh, Egypt, Assad in Syria, that doesn't eliminate corruption. Or indeed, Saddam before 2003, that channels corruption from one source as opposed to multiple sources into a one ruling elite as opposed to multiple. So I, I wouldn't celebrate the move towards dictatorship, I'm not saying you are, but I wouldn't celebrate the move towards dictatorship at delivering a coherent, legal, rational, transparent, and efficient state. It will deliver a state ruled by one man who will use all the aspects that we've seen, violence, corruption, whatever, but to consolidate one man rule, not multi ruling elite. Thanks, so Doug Oliver with New America. Uh, I think we need to all take a deep breath here. Maliki is the Prime Minister of Iraq because he has the support of his own party, the support of the INA, as was demonstrated this like last weekend when Sadr demonstrates is perfectly happy to fly up there and make fools of Alawi and Barzani and make his own statements, but has no interest in overthrowing the current regime. And it also appears to me as a support of the PUK, Talibani has also not made any significant statements about Maliki. Um, that's why he's the Prime Minister. He, they don't have the votes for a no-confidence vote. Um, Yes, Irakia is not happy with this, you know, having representing the group that was in power for several generations, then having representing a group that tried to overthrow the majority in the civil war, lost that civil war, and then somehow miraculously thought their 25% vote share was going to put them in charge of the country. They're not happy with that. And I think in some ways this paper mirrors uh, the talking points I hear from Irakia reps. I think, in, and I think there's some bad history in the, the way that you write out uh, how Maliki's rise to power. Um, the operation centers weren't set up by Maliki, they were set up by the Americans, despite some warnings that th these were a bad idea and they bypassed the, the role of the ministries, we shouldn't do this. Uh, there were Americans who came up with this and enthusiastically set them up. Um, and, you, you, and you also seem to alight over your presentation the stubborn fact that the security forces were infiltrated and there were members of al-Qaeda in Iraq and sympathizers of al-Qaeda in Iraq who were in the security forces in 2007-2008. Um, we know this. Now, Maliki's certainly no angel. Did he use this excuse to move some people aside and get his own people in power? You know, sure, he, he had weekly BTCs with George W. Bush. You know, they, He learned a lot about the strong use of the executive power. But that doesn't make you a dictator. And it strikes me Maliki is still to say Erdogan's left on the dictator scale as to you know how much you consolidated power. So I guess my question is, do we, all, do we just need to take a deep breath um, and see where we are and see what happens with elections? And I think the only really disturbing th thing you brought out today is the arrest of the IHEC, and it'll be interesting to see if that was a minor bureaucratic snafu that did really occur under Maliki's radar, or if that's the leading indicator of something more serious, and then we would have a problem. Well, it's, it's nice to hear you speak so favorably of the Prime Minister. I could write, uh, I could write a long paper on the myriad faults of Iraq here, and I could mir 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 mirror that quite neatly. And, and, and running through this is, is the kind of fractured nature of the Iraqi elite um, that allowed the Prime Minister to do what he's done. Um, on the specific points, uh, yes, the Americans set up the operation center and have decried their control afterwards. They encouraged, or at least didn't discourage, the setting up of the office of the Commander in Chief, but have decried the way it's been used afterwards. Certainly, there are, I mean, there, there's another long paper to be written, probably by you and not me, about the sins of a mission or commission made by the United States, certainly, uh, during the surge and afterwards, and how this may or may not have led to how. Um, the, the, the military strategy in the surge was very effective, but the political strategy was never applied, then leaving a fractured elite 
with a very weak civil service, a very weak uh, civil society, a uh, very weak institutional state, which is almost an open goal for uh, uh, the consolidation of power. I suppose, you know, we can both go to an orchard and you can see apple trees and I can see orange trees. We can argue about the difference. The truth will be in moving forward, I, as you saw in that paper, I can give you chapter and verse about what he's done with footnoting about his statements, about his statements about the electoral vote not standing as a threat, the return to violence, about his statements about overturning. It, it, the, 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 um, the press conference he gave in the aftermath of uh, the, troop, the US troop withdrawal saying that he wanted to overturn the Abel, uh, agreement and, and move towards the consolidation of power. It, you know, we can argue about the interpretations of that. I would argue that if you remember, if you're a politically Ara uh, active Iraq, you need a mid-level intelligence officer. Life in, in Iraq, life is very uncomfortable. And then we can argue about who's making that uncomfortable if you're politically active Iraqi. The use of the security services to demobilize the movement in Baghdad around the Arab Spring was not the actions of a Democrat. Um, the use of violence, arrest without trial, torture in Iraq is not the actions of the Democrat. Now, again, to some extent, uh, going back to the West, it, it, is, the, is the consolidation of power after a civil war a bad thing? I mean, the juxtaposition of that. Is it indeed unavoidable? That I'm just uh, involved in a research project which looks at the, the aftermath of civil wars, and you see this consolidation of power. There's a good argument about that. You build up a large military to impose order that needs to be imposed. Civil society is fractured. It's very hard, very difficult, very brave to mobilize in the aftermath of intense violence. All of that is true. That doesn't leave, if, if that leaves you believing that, that, that Nuri al-Maliki is somehow not on a, on a road to consolidating power, to threatening democracy, threatening his rivals, and using the unconstitutional um, and, and, in fact, illegal potential without trial and violence, then we're studying two different countries. Thank you, thank you, Andrew, and uh, thank you to IIIS for the invitation. That'll be uh, great seeing, you. great seeing you. My name is Ahmed Ali Mirak, and I've uh, always heard your work, so it's a pleasure to see you in person. Uh, my question has to do with Iraq and the, well, specifically Maliki and the region. So what seems to be happening is an acceptance by pretty much all regional countries that Maliki is in power, and we have to work with them and have to deal with them. Uh, I wonder if I could get your analysis on Maliki's relations with the regional countries and what they mean for Maliki's rise or maybe Maliki's demise. Right, yeah, the kind of tour of the, uh, the regional capitals and their view of Maliki. I think um, the most obvious one is Iran, but I think I'd be happy to say this clearly. You know, the, we could argue about the details. Maliki has comparative autonomy from Tehran. I think his visit to Tehran had uh, some useful outcomes, not least Sada's ambiguity in, um, in, in, in their bill that Doug's mentioned. I think certainly uh, when Sada came to swing his support behind Maliki in the run-up to the Abil agreement, the proclamation he put on his website was a choice reading to his followers. I'm sorry, you don't understand you may not understand, but I had to do this. This isn't uh, a populist, radical uh, politician saying that he was forced by his own, uh, his own, his own followers to do this. This is clearly uh, a reference to the pressure he was getting from Tehran. And I think uh, that pressure may have been reapplied in the run-up to the this 28th of uh, April statement. Um, so, yeah, Iran is there. It, it's supported. I think primarily not because they like Maliki. Clearly, they would have, uh, in, in the run-up to the election, they clearly would have seen an alternative uh, leader from within the INA as a much better choice. But the, the, the vote that Alawi got scared them deeply, and, and the kind of reworking of Iraq's position would have been that. I think Turkey is really into uh, Turkey is fascinating. I think I'm right in saying the Turkish ambassador in Baghdad is the only one who's been formally reprimanded by the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The Minister of Foreign Affairs for activism on becoming a diplomat in Baghdad, which given what the Iranian ambassador, indeed what the American ambassador is up to, strikes me as somewhat uh, amusing, if not ironic. Um, that's Turkey seeking to, to, to bolster what it sees as its allies within Baghdad, uh, much the same as Iran or the United States. I don't, I, don't, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that, but that shows the tension uh, with, um, with Maliki and indeed the, 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 the different outcome they would see. Um, uh, 
the, the, the somewhat changing mood music between Damascus and, and Baghdad through the Arab Spring, in, I think is indicative of, of, of the pro both Maliki's relationship with Iran, but I think much more straightforwardly the problems, the profound problems that Baghdad will have with an outcome, a dra dramatic outcome in Damascus, which brings us down to Saudi Arabia, which I think has got an absolutely dreadful relationship with Maliki, partly uh, for this for the strategic tensions between uh, Riyadh and Tehran, but also partly, in, and, and we shouldn't uh, minimize this, anyone who goes to Riyadh will hear this repeatedly, the anger and the blame they place at Maliki's board for the slaughter of what they would see as their fellow Sunnis in Baghdad during the uh, civil war. That hasn't gone away. That doesn't necessarily need to be a problem. As you saw in the Nazi Arab summit, um, Iraq has moved uh, a, a great deal to, to court, or at least minimize the problem with QA. What does that mean at the moment, grandly, uh, overall? With relative autonomy towards Tehran, with bad relations towards Saudi, with ambiguous relations, but broadly supportive of the status quo in Damascus, I think that gives Iraq, if not a buyout, then at least a bypass from the increasing regional tensions between Saudi and Iraq. It doesn't make it a cockpit, which it, which it's avoided doing. And I don't get uh, pragmatic. I think that's a pretty good place for them to be. To get back to Julia's question, if Syria does collapse, that the luxury of comparative autonomy and ambiguity disappears overnight. And I think that's why the situation in Syria is so uh, potentially problematic for the ruling regime in, in uh, Baghdad. Uh, Toby, just uh, help me understand one, one further point on Sadr. Uh, when one looks at the possibility of a, a no confidence uh, vote, if that's even a real possibility, if one does the numbers, it does come down to, at least now, what kind of Sadr's. What's his one? Is there any chance at all that Mokhtar Sadr would? join the no confidence vote. And two, related question, what, what was his motivation, I me understand a little more, why he went to Erbil and signed uh, the points if he's not willing to take that step? Right, well, many of us in this audience looking around and seeing familiar faces who spent a long time trying to understand Sada and the Sada, some of us got it wrong on occasion. <laughs> and so I enter this uh, gently and with a degree of uh, historic humility. Um, I think Sada is caught between two constituents. Caught between, if you want to be normative about it, it's two constituents. Which, he's, which are the disaffected, alienated, not largely young men, but uh, what we used to call in the old days in London proletariat, the urban, underemployed or unemployed people of uh, Baghdad and the South who've, who've formed Jesh uh, uh, al-Mahdi, who have voted for him, who invest hope in him, and, and who his organization has been repeatedly and occasionally surprisingly successful in local. I think his organization, as the way they prepared for the, the national elections, is surprisingly astute. It's both strategically and tactically outflanked its opposition on, 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 on occasion. Uh, and and <coughs> much through the frustration of, of Rema, you know, uh, Sistani on occasion, uh, the Supreme Council, and, and, and possibly Maliki. So there is a skilled organization and a sophisticated strategic understanding of the problem. There's also, let's not be unfair or uh, romantic about that, but there's also a militia which, which was violently sectarian and one of the key forces of driving Iraq in civil war, unleashed absolute horror on Baghdad, so that, there's no doubt about that. There's also a man for his own and different reasons who's been on enforced holiday in Qom for quite a while and has come under the time to see that in direct influence that shapes and constrains what he can do, and that's to run. And I think that the longer he stayed there, the, the more detached he's come from his movement and the more control of Tehran, the more influence that say, uh, control Tehran has had over his movement. But I think we see that in the decision to go to Erbil. You know, the, the decision, the desire, the need to play a, to continue to play a national a role uh, in the national movement, to be head of his movement and to give voice to the movement's anger with Maliki. It's, it's hammering that it took during the charge of the night and, and there's still resentment it faces on one side. 
but also to, to keep in with his hosts and to, to, to keep a line with them. And I think so he goes up to be able to play a national role, as he repeatedly does. He takes part as a national politician in a discussion around the profound doubts he undoubtedly, for good historic reasons, has about Maliki's consolidation of power. And then he doesn't do anything. And then, he, you know, as I said, at the moment he landed out on the tarmac and it really made it very clear what he wasn't going to do. And, and so we waited to see what he was going to do. And I mean, there's, there's an ongoing argument about the nine points uh, in, the, in the letter published in the newspaper, you know, vague, wishful thinking, some demands. I think that the last one was the most important one, and I think that was so. And it, it's nice to see that we put ourselves once again in the line with the United States State Department, because both of them don't want a third term from the real money. I want to abolish Chris, uh, hunger and I want some nice presents for Christmas. That doesn't mean I'm going to get them. And I suspect unless you've got a hard and fast policy wishing for the, the, the removal of the third term for uh, Malachi is no more than much. One more question. Uh, Chris, I should Hi, Chris. Yes. Um, Toby, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that if this trend line continues, this could become very problematic in the United States. <coughs> Granted, we prefer democracies to dictatorships, <coughs> but we also tend to historically work quite well with dictatorships when the need arises. Um, so I wonder if you could just explain in sort of real political terms why uh, this, this trend line to continue would be uh, problematic for the United States, and, and also whether the U.S. administration, this administration, and the State Department um, recognize this as a problem. What's your view on it? Yeah, the, I can answer the first one. Uh, very quickly, I'm not sure. I'll let you know uh, before I leave town. Um, as I said, I think to Judith, um, I think the decision taken to disengage from Iraq militarily, it was a long time, long time coming and almost unavoidable, even if this wasn't an election year, even if that, that hadn't been the kind of keynote point of Obama's uh, winning over Hillary Clinton to get the all things I say, I can see that. And you and you can see when faced with, uh, I may disagree with me on this, but when faced with at least an ambi ambiguous outcome for the elections, that they swung their support behind the continuity candidate. The able agreement is basically that. And they worked very hard, I think, to encourage the locking in of institutional constraints. And if you speak to State Department and NSC people who are involved in the Hitler agreement. So what else, what else can we do? What do you want to, you know, uh, as Doug was saying, what do you want to give 25%, I'm now misquoting Doug, but I'll say anyway, to a haphazard politi a group of politicians who've never done very well. You know, this is dream. Okay, fine, we can, I can see that argument, and I'm, uh, and I'm not uh, writing talking points for our peers, uh, earlier, earlier accused. I can see the problems that they face. And I can see, especially in the aftermath of that Iraqi is not coherent enough, and certainly hasn't a strategic vision, Doug Smiley now I'm getting, getting it, hasn't got the strategic vision to act as a coherent government as yet, fine. I can see all that. The Ebel Agreement failed, directly failed. It was completely overturned by Maliki with a, a precision and a flagrant disregard for its contents that I find amazing. I mean, admirable if you think this man is a, but certainly a high stakes poker player, or he recognises, I'm sure he recognises the sort of nine point letter today, letter on um, uh, the issue for the bill, that these guys can't stop it. So that's right. So to directly answer the question, what does this mean? And that's what I'm trying to touch on a little bit. What will this mean for Iraq, if I'm right and Doug's wrong, that we are heading towards a dictatorship, that the next set of elections, if they take place, will be highly managed in a Putin esque way to shape the outcome? <laughs> Start. What does this mean for Iraq? I think we have, a, and that's what I was trying to touch on the end, it's not going to be business as usual in the way of a kind of stable, uh, Mubarak like dictatorship, where we don't like what goes on in the prisons, we don't like what's happening in the society, but we can just about weave in being the US government back it because of stability. The Ebola agreement stretched out through to dictatorship of 10 and 20. It's not going to be stable. This is a very rough, if it happened, this is a very rough and ready move towards consolidation of power, where the, 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 the fractured ruling elite, empowered and brought back to the country by the United States, will have to be demobilized and moved out of it. But there will be violence, and that the Iraqi state isn't coherent enough to buy its population off. 
to suppress all violence. This is the kind of Nigeria on steroids hasn't got the ideology to unite together. The Barzani, as the 15, F-16s arrive, will be jumping up and down and saying, but you sold them to him. So it will, it, it will pose both profound issues of policy. This is going to be a rough and ready ride to dictatorship, not a smooth stability, and profound issues post-Arab Spring. Do we, he may be our illegitimate, he may be an illegitimate ruler, but he's our illegitimate ruler. Well, if he's yours, do you live with him? Do you back him? This is the aftermath. Of, of the invasion regime change and all the extended blood and treasure. People we all know <coughs> died in the dust of Baghdad for another dictatorship. So, yeah. so these issues are going to come up. And I, and I think if it was a move towards regime consolidation on the sly, that we can forget about what's going on in Baghdad and so can you. That may be, I'm not, I wouldn't back it, but you can see the logic behind it, but it's not going to be that. It's going to be nasty, it's going to be violent, it's very really unstable. Your own cameras will be filming it, and the question will continually come back to the White House. You signed off on this. What for? And I think that's the question that should be placed in front of the United States government. You can ignore it until your second term. OK, I can see that. Then what do you do? As this goes on, as consolidation becomes more and more violent, more and more violent, and more and more oppressive, or indeed, we get to it. Happy third term where someone else gets elected, which I don't think anyone in terms of What happens and what degree of policy responsibility does this government, this administration bear for not trying to shape a different world? That's all. It's not a great kind of stunning indictment. It's not a 12 guilty men, one guilty man in the White House. It is you know, the situation it's ongoing. It's charted, it, you can chart it and see it without much. Uh, without much disagreement by Iraq powers, such as one maybe. And what's the problem with that? It's going to be bloody, it's going to be destabilizing, and you've got to take a policy position on it. Toby, uh, you've given us a lot today in your analysis, and you've raised many important policy questions.